As most of you know, Troy and I own what is known as the Jane Mansfield death car. Jane Mansfield wasn't the only fatality in the car accident. Her attorney, boyfriend, 40-year-old Sam Brody, and 19-year-old Ronald Harrison, who was driving the vehicle, were also killed. Three of Jane's five children were in the car and survived the accident with minimal injuries. We displayed the car at the Dilly Departed Tours and Artifact Museum in Hollywood until 2020. We shut our doors and placed the car and all of our artifacts in storage until a future location can be secured. Now, the story of the car that night is a little complicated. Jane was performing at the Gus Stevens Supper Club in Biloxi, Mississippi. She was to appear the next day in New Orleans, a couple of hours away. Gus Stevens himself loaned him his car, a 1966 gray Buick Electra, for the journey. Gus had one of his supper club's parking attendants and his daughter Elaine's fiancé, 19-year-old Ronald Harrison, to drive the group to New Orleans in Gus Stevens' personal vehicle. As is well known, the car never made it to New Orleans. The tragic accident occurred. Ronnie Harrison's fiancé and Gus Stevens' daughter, Elaine Stevens, agreed to speak with me. This is our conversation. How did you meet Ronnie? In high school. He came. He was a transplant from Meridian, Mississippi. And uh, he had moved uh, at one point to New Orleans. And uh, he was known for his uh, sort of boxing style. You know, tall and lanky and blue-eyed and unbelievable work ethic, just extraordinary work ethic. And uh, we were on a double date with a good friend of mine, um, and he and I just took up after that. She was with him, and I, I don't even remember who I was with, but uh, apparently it was forgettable. So, um, mm. But Ron and I took up together, and that's how we met in high school. So. And he was a funny guy. He was funny. He was humorous. He was lanky. He was um, all, you know, like this, and just the antithesis of what my parents wanted for me, except for his work work ethic, you know. And uh, Ronnie held down three jobs at a time sometimes. Wherever there was money involved, Ronnie was there. And he was into music, too? Not very much so. He used to sing to me all the time, and he and Johnny Rivers became close. He still has Johnny Rivers' guitar, uh, the family does, and one of the nephews. So, uh, yeah, he and Johnny were close. That's so cool. That sounds I, – I love hearing about him because, you know, we've talked briefly or we exchanged messages briefly, and now to me, uh, you know, Ronnie is, is the kid, the driver, we, you know. The driver, the that's what they mm-hmm. called him, the driver, yeah. yeah. And that's how I knew him too. Uh, it was only because I, I ended up being – you know, sort of the, uh, I guess, the owner uh, of the of the vehicle and learning more about it and learning, you know, studying the accident itself and the misconceptions about it and uh, and wanting to know about him because he's sort of the one that nobody knows by name. And uh, That's a great way to put it. He's, uh, I don't know, and everything I've read about him was really he was a stand-up guy. And uh, and and people think that he was you know drunk or high, and, and I know that's no. not true. No. And uh, and then he fell asleep, and that's completely not true no. because. Not so um, so to me, you know, it's it's just the, like 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 I said, the kid that nobody really knows about, and that that to me, because uh, he was such an important part of an event that means a lot to me and a lot of people, and it changed everything for you. Uh, so. Uh, so yeah, he was. So he he worked as a clothes salesman too, and he was parking cars at your dad's for extra and money. And a refreshment concession stand at our Gulfport High School football games. He was entrepreneurish. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody, I read somewhere that he was a he was a selective service. Is that true? Uh, that what do you mean? Was he? Up for the draft? Is that what you're saying? Well, I, that's what I didn't quite understand. It just said that I think it was in the accident report. I think where it came from that it said he, he had was a in the card. Yeah, he had a draft card, but uh, I mean, uh, at the time, selective service card. But you know, that wasn't even on our radar. We were got we, it. You know, that wasn't even part of where we were headed. We were to be married in three days. My wedding dress hung in the closet. I was pregnant with our daughter, 
Um, we were going to Bay Manette. Shades of Romeo and Juliet, our Orthodox priest, Russian Orthodox priest, Father Michael, was assisting us with our plans, you know, um, very did Shakespearean. You, did your Montague folks know was, that you were uh, you were pregnant? After he died, they did. <laughs> yeah. No, they didn't know. They didn't. Mm-mm. Did not how, know. How far along were you at that point? Let's see. Uh, Angela was born in January, and Ronnie died in June. Okay. Wow. So that must have been quite a shock uh, for, for them, not for you. <laughs> <laughs> 1967, the summer of love. I took it seriously. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, I mean, I'd imagine that, I mean, with everything going on, you know, with because I know that there were lawsuits and, and, and you know, you were – your family were grieving, and and the Harrisons were grieving, and and the Mansfield people were grieving. There was so much emotion and drama going on, and then on top of that, this lovely gift of a daughter comes up, and you have to kind of go, no, we're gonna we're not going to acknowledge that. And so, what did they keep you at home during that time, or how, what happened? How did you that's, keep that under wraps? Be- that's the beauty of this book, Scott, is that uh, there's an entire chapter dedicated to my departure. Okay, so you were removed from the situation. Yes. Hmm. Yes. They wanted me to pretend as though it never happened, just wipe it away. Wow. That, uh, that's so emotional. Now, there's a photograph of, of Ronnie. Is that with Jerry Van Dyke? Yes. There is one with Ronnie with Jerry. Uh-huh. That's a great picture, Ronnie. I know. Uh, yeah. Now, is that you and Ronnie in the graduation picture? Yes. That is one. I love that picture. That is. Uh, I that's, that's such a nice picture. So the um, all right. So let's go to the night. Now I'm going to go through what I know and okay. or what I've what I've uh, what I've been able to put together. So Jane was to go to New Orleans. Correct. They bought a Rolls Royce. For some reason, their check bounced or whatever it was, and and they, the the person who was going to sell them the Rolls Royce uh, took it back. So they Correct. needed a way to get to New Orleans, Correct. and demanded. Well, they said you're, they asked your father to get a limo. Your father said no because you're not working here right now. You can't get a limo or something to that effect. Uh, Actually, then they, I was told that it was too late. I mean, everything was happening so late. You know, these people were had strange circadian rhythms or lack thereof. But they, you know, they were night people, and we couldn't get a, a limo mm-hmm. because that's what I, you know, I was at home waiting for the three days to pass so I could be a wife and a mother. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of activity at the restaurant going on at that time when I was waiting. You know, um, and ended up having Ronnie come by. So yeah. They, mother and dad had a big fight about the Buick. They, she didn't want to let him use the Buick because of the liability, and the, you know these people are not responsible and um, will be liable, which we ended up being liable. And um, so she didn't want to let him use the Buick, but eventually it did. And daddy couldn't find anybody to drive, um, so finally Ronnie jumped up there and volunteered, and. Um, there were several people that were supposed to go and to, to go with him. In fact, I wanted to go, but they, of course, they wouldn't let me. Green girls don't do that. They don't go to New Orleans in the middle of the night. <laughs> right. Yeah, and not anyone, no one else could fit in that car. Well, it was a big car. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, so, so now, as I, so what? Now, th- this was an important part of the lawsuit that your dad did not pay Ronnie, but Sam said something like, we'll give you 20 bucks. Is that how it went? Ronnie was parking cars. Yeah. So, you know, it was, he was working for tips, which were better than what Daddy would have paid him, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And so he had, Daddy said, are you tired? And he said, yeah, I'm tired, but I'll go home and take a nap in the lake and come get me. and, And, you know, she can bring me the Buick. You know, he, so we worked all that out. And Daddy paid him in tips, and he did get twenty bucks. Yeah. But your dad didn't hire him, right? That was that was what was important. Is that well, Sam- that's a technicality, you know? Yeah, because that I think that was that figured into the legalese of all that stuff. 
he was not legally an employee of Dad's at the time that he was driving the car. So symbolically, the beginning of it was that night, really. The the beginning of the really end. Of- was. It was hmm. really shattering, you know. It was absolutely, you know, I was in another world because I just, I, I just could not believe. I used to call the store and hear, try to hear Ronnie's voice because he had this wonderful way of saying Curry's menswear, and he was on the, you know, the recorder. Hmm. I used to call it just to hear his voice, just make sure that. It, because I kept thinking, this is not really happening. Hmm. I can, uh, well, I can't, I can't even imagine. So you did draw it, but you're, you, huh, this is confusing. This is something I've always needed clarification of. So Ronnie was going to drive them to New Orleans. And, and part of the reason, I guess, was that he was very familiar, uh, unfortunately, I guess, uh, very familiar with the route. And uh, so that's why he was brought in for that. And um, it sounded as if, Ron, well, I don't want to get too far ahead of it yet. I, I, so he, that night, your dad made sure that Ronnie went home and got some rest. Yes, he did. And then you went to pick up Ronnie in the Buick? So Ronnie drove out of the parking lot in his car, and I went to pick Ronnie up at his, at his mom and dad's house, and then he dropped me off, and I have a chapter called The Last Words You Said. Um, which is complete. So, so, so you went to pick him up. You were driving your mom's car to pick him up, okay. and then and then, and then you got in and he drove. Yeah. And then yeah. dropped you off at your house. Yeah, for on. some reason they didn't want him in the house that night. I guess they were afraid I was going to run away, or uh, I guess it was after hours and whatever. So the last words he said to me is, "Well, you always love me." He asked thought, you? Yeah. Wow. So, I, you know, there's a lot of mental rumination that went into that one phrase after he was gone that, you know, I, I had to really examine a lot of that and figure out what he meant by it. And Boy, that would be a trip. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine that going through your head all the time. It's so ominous to ask you that. I know, that's the point, yeah. I mean, that, you know, because it was like, I just, there was a lot of thinking that went into that one statement. I went all over the place with that, which I delved into in the book. So, Ronnie Ronnie dropped you off at your home, and then he he left for the nightclub. And right. As I understand it, now this is what I'm going through. I'm going by the accident report, and these are this is something. He went back to eat at the restaurant. He went back to eat with my cousin Johnny. So, so Johnny was with Ronnie. Johnny and Ronnie had uh, an open faced roast beef sandwich, signed it off to Daddy, and then Ronnie went off to get uh, the kids. Well, she was there, so he she got in the car. You can check with Eric on that, but I, I, she was at the restaurant. She had just finished her show, and then they had to go and pick up the kids. Mm-hmm. They were being uh, watched by someone, a local person, who will not speak to you of anything about that, as I've been told, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, so the children were being watched um, at the Edgewater Hotel, I want to say. Mm-hmm. That so, was where they were staying, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I went there and I uh, just checked out the uh, the area. So then they loaded up into the car, right, and went back to the nightclub. Your dad paid them. I think they asked for a couple of bottles of booze, correct, and sandwiches. Mm-hmm. And then uh, told Ronnie to take the light bulbs out of the car. Because mm-hmm. Jane was a little bit obsessed with her own publicity and would play with her scrapbooks. So. Brody must have said, ask Ronnie to take the light bulbs out of the car. So she There's different the... versions of that about who yeah. took the light bulbs out and who took them in, but I understood that Ronnie took them out, but he also wanted to put them back in because he was worried. And that when they stopped at the Texaco station on the way down Highway 90, mm-hmm. they had been, he wanted to put another bulb in. But she... Yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, yeah, that's all I know, really. I mean, well, I mean, that was confusing stuff. because they they asked Ronnie to take the light bulbs out. This is what I understand from the report, and then so, but Jane said, "No, I want to. I want them looked at." And they stopped at the Texaco station, and the report said that they couldn't get it going or they couldn't get the light in there. But if Ronnie just removed the light bulb, I don't understand why that would have been so difficult. That's interesting. I, it's such it a is, minor it detail, but it's so. Yeah, because at that, at that point, the uh, the kids were in the front with Ronnie sleeping. Well, I think one was. I and then about all three of them. I don't. Re- I I I know that at least one. I wanted to say Dalton was, but um, the others were in the back. That, from what I understand, I could be wrong about that. Yeah, so that's, that's what I from what I what I recall. When when they showed up, this is what I what I thought I read. Now, I might be wrong, but I, I read that I thought I understood that the kid at the gas station said that the three kids were in the front with Ronnie. When they left, they put the kids in the back, and Jane was in the center seat, and Sam was in the passenger seat when he saw them pull out of the gas station. That's that was it was interesting, but he did specifically say that Mansfield was in the middle, and wow. then we know that that she wasn't sitting in the middle when the accident happened. And there's right. that, there's the, uh, I don't want to say mystery, but there's the curiosity about that, the White Kitchen, the uh, restaurant called the White Kitchen, because some people claim that they stopped there to, uh, so Jane could uh, use the toilet or buy a Coke or whatever it was. And uh, and there's somebody who actually said, you know, claims they had a, a an exchange with Jane Mansfield, but I don't think anybody that worked at the White Kitchen uh, ever really verified that? Have you heard otherwise? I heard the same thing that you heard. I heard they stopped there for her to go to the bathroom and to get a coke. And a woman told her uh, that she had beautiful hair and she was very friendly and open to this customer. And uh, Eric and I visited the remnants of the white kitchen, and you would like part of the bathroom floor there. Did you get part of the bathroom floor? Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pink, isn't it? <laughs> mm-hmm, it sure is. <laughs> yeah, we stopped there. So, um, yeah, that's the same thing I heard. So apparently they changed places, and she was in the passenger seat, and Brody was in the middle, and all the children were in the back with the dogs. As a, now, when your dad got the call that the accident had happened. It's a really complicated situation when the accident did happen because people were driving by, the children were taken to the hospital, the man driving the truck ran to the fogger to the call the police, and people were stopping. And it was really quite quite uh, uh, chaotic, of course. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. so your dad was notified that the car was in the accident and people died. And uh, he and your uncle, I think, drove to New Orleans. Is that how that went? Yeah, I um, there's a chapter called called phone calls, you know, because those phone calls ruined my life at the two thirty in the morning, you know, because after that I couldn't even to this day I don't like the phone in my bed. I don't want to know anything at that hour, you know. So, mm-hmm. um, it's not going to be good if that phone rings. Yeah. yeah. No, no. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of chaos in our home. We were all huddled in mom and daddy's room. There was screaming and crying and I had on a little kind of a trapeze kind of dress because they didn't know I was pregnant and I remember what I was wearing. And there was like, they didn't want to tell me and I kept saying, oh, well, Ronnie walked away. He's so strong. He just walked away to get help. And I really had this vision of him you know, having walked away from the accident. That's the first thing that came to me. I mean, I could not imagine that anything terrible like that would have happened. And finally, you know, they had to tell me. And uh, it was, whew. Um, And, you know, I was in my bed and a lot of medical stuff going on and sedating and trying to get us married post-mortem and, all of that sort of thing, a lot of stuff. And was that it, something that you were trying to do or your your folks were trying to do? Folks, my folks. They were, oh, that's interesting. Well, I guess I understand that. Um, 
I think they were trying because my doc, Dr. Russell came to the house and he said he told them I was pregnant. And so I guess they were trying to get us married so they could legitimize the birth of the child. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so they put, they literally put a wedding band on Ronnie at the funeral home. All right. So after after the accident, uh, I wanted to talk to you about the car. Yeah. So how did you get it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what? I was thing? I was sitting there trying to figure out the timeline of the car. Now, your dad had it. I, I, there's footage of it at the in New Orleans. It was impounded for the longest time because of lawsuits, et cetera. Then it was ultimately ultimately released to your dad. dad? It was your mom's car. Yeah, and uh, and uh, and uh, and he had just uh, like a, a week or so earlier spent I think it was about eighty bucks on this thing, which is a lot of money back in '67 to have it serviced. So it was in run, perfect running order, and right. uh, and thus it was used for this. Uh, now I don't know what your dad did with it. In the meantime, they must have said, "Here, you take it." Uh, they're not going to keep it in a garage in New Orleans indefinitely. So your dad must have had possession of it somewhere. Maybe he, you know, maybe he parked it somewhere or something. I don't know. But um, Daddy but he, had it at the Rainbow Ranch in the barn. Oh, he did. Okay. My brother told me about it. I didn't know about it till last year or the year before that. <clears throat> that Daddy kept it there. He was planning to sell it off, and I don't know how you got it. Where, where your chain of purchases and the whole spectrum of things. But, you know, I left the coast several times and kept coming back for different reasons. Um, And my brother used to go out to the farm, and he saw the car, and he said he found teeth in there. This is what my brother said now. Mm -hmm. He said, Dad, you've got to get rid of this. It's morbid. No, I'm going to sell it, and that's all I know. We're, we're like the seventh owners of this car. Oh and, wow! I didn't know seven. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And uh, but it, again, it's and it's licensed in the state of California. It is uh, it is titled here, which is so bizarre. But uh, um, the the car itself, you know, what do you, how do you feel about with something that means so much? So different than most people. Uh, most people think about it as the, the tragic death of this blonde bombshell. To you, it's the tragic death of uh, one of the most important people in your life. Uh, yeah. How how do you feel about that being on you know out there on display? I, I I'm I'm not a fan of that. You know, I I don't. It wouldn't be something I would want to see. I try to be a grown up now about it because I was so childlike when it happened that I and so innocent and part of it is that ripping away of naivete and all the purity that you're expecting your life to be and when you see the car it's a symbol of the destruction of it all. So it's not something I really would I don't need to see it, you know. I mm-hmm. see I've seen pictures. I, I waited many years before I looked at pictures. Yeah, I I I I understand that. I think uh, I can't I can't completely understand that because it doesn't affect me on the level that it does you. And uh, and and also another thing that that one of the things about the accident that is important to me, people still talk about it being a foggy night. Now we know that it was it was error. We know that it was. I think. Do, would you agree that it was Ronnie was very uh, overconfident about his driving that night? Ronnie and I would have discussions about his driving, Scott. Mm-hmm. We had <laughs> we had fights about it. You know, mm-hmm. you're driving too fast. So, and I know yeah. Jane liked to go fast. So yeah. he probably it was probably a, a double edged thing going on there. You know, he wanted to drive fast. She wanted to get there. She made him drive faster. She liked to go fast. So that you know, so I think everybody was responsible. I don't think it was just you know one situation where Ronnie decided to go. That speed, but the people that we've talked to since the accident said they shot out of the white kitchen parking lot like bats out of hell, you know, just really going crazy fast. So um, he was not impaired because he wasn't like that. You know, in those days, we didn't do anything. 
bad like that. <laughs> we didn't drink or smoke or do anything. Mm-hmm. So and if he wasn't drinking, I think they had been drinking, but they weren't driving. So, right. You know, yeah. No, they were definitely. They were definitely. I don't know. They were. Well, they never said if they were hammered or not. But Ronnie had. He had. Um, he had lost his driver's license though from another accident, didn't he? That's what I heard. I didn't. You know, I don't really know. It was uh, they. Well, he didn't have his driver's license with him, and then his folks. His folks couldn't find it, but it turned out where he had an accident, and there was a with the with the. Um, the logistics of that was, but he had yeah his driver's license was suspended on March ninth, pending his purchase of insurance and filing their SR twenty two with the Department of Public Safety in Jackson due to an accident on December thirty first sixty four three years earlier, which is um, which is weird, but um, I mean that, 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 that didn't... for us see that that was before us. How long were you were you were you together with Ronnie? We weren't together for more than, um, he gave me a St. Christopher's medal and said, love Ronnie for a year or something, or one year anniversary, so a little over a year. Do you still I, I, have, do you still have the medal? I do. I knew you would. I knew you would. Yeah. That's too precious. <clears throat> I can't. Uh, I got goosebumps thinking about that. I really do. That is, uh, it's such a emotional. Um, gosh, emotional. It's 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 such a. Uh, it's so strange. The whole thing is so bizarre, and your experience is even more bizarre because because of it just didn't end there. To us, Jay Mansfield was killed. The end. I know. And to I'm, you, that's where it began, almost. You know, it did. It was like you know, the it just completely altered everything in my life. You know, and and continued to because you know you don't. I, even in the book when I write about the Mansfield Bar, I see it. I cannot not think about it every time we're behind a truck. You know, I see it. I can. I try to imagine how it must have been. But, um, it, you know, it's just very, um, it's an emotional thing, obviously. And it really is. And the, because I relived that night, the night of the phone call was really sh- horrible. That was just the most horrible thing of all. But um, we never focused on it in my family. And we tried to do away with as much of that as we possibly could, you know, um, or they did. Um, it, it just it leaves a deep wound, you know. It's like you're like you're gutted. Just yeah, completely I can gutted. imagine. So. Wow. And, and you know what, Elaine, you, you've given me so much time and so much fun conversation. Well, that me too, Scott. You've taught me a great deal. I, there are many things... I didn't know. I didn't want to know. Um, I never really thought about knowing. Um, I hope this is not the last of our conversation. No, I hope so, too. And then tell me the name of your book again. It is called Mermaid in the Window. Mermaid in the Window, and it is taken from the mermaid statue that was in Daddy's window, which symbolizes the threat of sexuality, sensuality, that was pervasive in our lives, you know, with all the kinds of things, the adult form of entertainment that we featured there, and the story of the mermaid. Because the mermaid, that's how I start the book off, with with the legend of the mermaid. People never learn. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, I won't take up any more of your time. Oh, are you kidding? Thank you, Elaine. I'll be in touch. Okay, dear. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Elaine, for your generosity with your time and your stories. We all very much appreciate it and look forward to your book, Mermaid in the Window. Thank you everyone for watching, especially to the subscribers of my channel and to the Patreon page, which there is a link below. Especially thank you to James Harrington and Charlotte L. And a super special thanks to Jolene and Esme. You're all so very kind and generous, and I appreciate you very much. Until next time. You heard me.